Belmont, Mississippi's Mac McAnally is a Mississippi treasure, has a new album coming out on July 31st. It's called Once in a Lifetime. It's a combination of new songs, a few favorites from the early 2000s, and a fantastic cover of the Beatles' Norwegian Wood. Mac has won a record-setting 10 Country Music Association Musician of the Year trophies, and you can tell it on this album. He also recently co-produced Jimmy Buffett's new album, Life on the Flipside. Mac, it's good to see you again. I'm glad to see you're doing safe and staying at home and staying healthy. Thank you, Marshall. It's, it's good to be here. Good to hear from, uh, from home state. I, I, I appreciate everybody in Mississippi, and I'm thinking good things about them every day. You know, one of the things I started doing during the quarantine was doing little coloring sheets around the state, and I did one for Belmont, and so I had to make sure I got you in on the front porch. <laughs> so, so that was a lot of fun. I got, I got the pre-quarantine the pre haircut there, too. So That's right. It's, uh, it's taken over like kudzu. Every, every day, I just want to make sure my eyebrows haven't thatched into something. <laughs> <laughs> my wife looked at my hair, and she got a picture of my high school yearbook, and she said, my God, you have 1986 hair. I said, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Pretty yeah. much. Hey, uh, before we get started about the new album, I just want to say thank you for doing the cover of John Prine's Hello in There, which has always been one of my just uh, such a moving and touching song, especially when my parents got older. But when you sang it, and, and particularly when he was sick, it was before he passed, but it was just so comforting. And I just want to say thanks. Well, I appreciate you saying that. John uh, was, was a hero of mine from the first time I ever heard him play a sing a note. And, uh, and then I, I got the privilege of opening shows for him, touring with him. Uh, like it rode the bus with him in the band, you know, in 78 for quite a while. And he, he, it wasn't just me. He, he tends to take people under his wing and, uh, and treat them really well. And, and he, he was a mentor to me and he was great friends with, with Buffett who I'm still running around with as well. But uh, it, John means a lot and, and nobody does it better than he did it. I don't think. And that was just, that was a heartfelt thing. I just picked it up and said, I wonder if I can play hello in there without breaking down crying. And, the, you know, and I made it once and videoed that. <laughs> and that's what that was. <laughs> so it, was it was perfect and fantastic, so thank you. And thank uh, you. Speaking, of, speaking of Jimmy Buffett, um, Life on the Flip Side is fantastic. It just really, his songwriting on it is as good as he's written in years. And uh, it hit while we were at the beach, so it was just a perfect soundtrack for the week. Well, you know, I, as, as appreciated as Jimmy is in so many ways, he's a, he's a, a, a great humanitarian, a great philanthropist. He's a great CEO of a company and all that, but people forget what a good writer he is. And, and, and he forgets what a good writer he is. And, and I, m part of my job, I think, is to poke at him and say, hey, let's see what happens if you roll up your sleeves and write a couple of songs. And he, he really did on this record. I'm, we're very proud of him. Yeah, he reached out to you after your first album, so you've known him for a long time. A long time, yes. Uh, the, the, uh, a friend, the, the guy who gave, Jay Lasker, who gave me my first record deal, was the same guy who gave Jimmy his first record deal. And he sent him a copy of my first album back, you know, a million, 1976. Uh, we finished that record. And, uh, and Jimmy wrote me a little note and said, we're going to be friends. We're both storytellers from Mississippi. I'm going to sing some of your songs. We're going to write songs together. And you never know in show business who means what they say, I don't think. But, uh, but he does. And all those things happen, plus a lot. And we're still running around together. It's, he's like family. And uh, the whole Coral Reefer, entourage is second family to me so it's it's turned out great I, for me and I, I hope him as well I, I think I think we're getting along pretty well <laughs> how about you still like each other after all these years we still like, like good, each other after all these years yeah. like a good marriage you, and you actually got the Coral Reefers to play on one of the songs on your new album yeah it, it came about uh, Will Kimbrough who's a great friend and a great songwriter too was down in Key West we were tracking uh, Jimmy's uh, new album and, and had the band together and, and we cut this song and it was a possibility he might sing it, but it, it ended up, I, 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 I tend to say it got kicked down to the minor leagues to come down to my album and, and me singing it. But, uh, but I, love, I love being part of the Coral Reefer Band and having them as my rhythm section for that one song is a, is a special thing. It's called yeah, Just I was, looking, I was looking at the liner notes on the new album, and here's, here's how an album goes for you. You're like, okay, I'm going to come up with a new album. I'll write the songs. I've, I'll pick a couple songs I've done before, and I'm going to produce it in my studio, and I need some musicians. Let me look at my schedule, and I'll do all the music. I mean, you did everything for, for percussion for the most part on this album. Well, I mean, it was not uh... – 
I, I don't want to say it was by design. I, you know, I'm blessed in that if I sit around long enough in a studio, I can kind of make it seem like I can play more than one instrument, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, more, I'm more of a studio rat than, than a musician probably sometimes. But my shows in the last few years have been myself and Eric Darkin, our percussionist, and Eric and I play together. And we, we, I've just come to love that, having played 20 years all by myself, having somebody else there to play off of it, particularly we're great friends and we can just load up a Suburban and, and decide where to eat and have a good time. And uh, I wanted the album to sort of basically be that, something that Eric and I could play. Uh, but then, you know, he would say, I hear another little percussion part and I go, well, go for it. And then I, well, I hear another little harmony part and I'll go for that. So I got to play some bass and some extra keyboards and stuff that I wouldn't normally get to play. There's only, I think there's only a rhythm section on maybe three tracks on the album and the rest of it is just Eric and myself and uh, we had a blast and I, I've always loved to since I was a kid in Belmont sit around and try to figure out a way to add how do you throw another part on and my dad was a school teacher so we had a bunch of those little wall and sack reel to reel recorders and I'd play one part and then hit play on that and play another part into another machine and that's what got me started trying to be an arranger or, or and I didn't even know you could do it professionally but that's that's what started me in this mess that I'm now still doing every day, all day long. <laughs> you better be careful what you do as a kid. It might end up becoming a career, right? Well, one of my standard lines is be, be careful what you make look easy. You know, exactly. and, uh, <laughs> well, I, and, I don't know that I make it look easy, but, but I have I've had, had a big time getting this done. Well, as a guy who tries to play harmonica and was influenced by Fingers Taylor and actually have gotten to meet him a few times before he's got ill, bless him. But yes. um, your harmonica playing and alive and in between is quite service, serviceable. You did a great job. <laughs> I had to give up a couple of mustache hairs to get that part right. <laughs> It'll grab it and pull. It's like oh, the worst it thing. Pulls. There's no question about it. Yeah, I, I always wondered when Fingers had a mustache how he pulled that one off. I didn't know. It doesn't qualify me as a real blues man, but but I did give up a couple of mustache hairs. I'm saying. <laughs> My hair's pretty coarse. <laughs> you know, what, I saw you in concert a few years ago up in Tupelo. You and Paul Thorne were playing together. And, of course, I've always said, you know, both of you, you tell great stories in between the songs. It's, it's almost as entertaining to hear the stories. But you played Little Martha. And, of course, you know, you told the story how you didn't know that it was two guitars, but you made it sound like two guitars. Norwegian Wood, which, you know, you're a huge Paul McCartney fan. And, and big time, big fan. time. Um, you took an octave mandolin and you made that the richest sounding recording on that. It was just so beautiful. What made you decide to record that song? You know, uh, two things. Well, one, I'm a ridiculous Beatle fan. Uh, that's one thing. But the second one is I, I bought this octave mandolin. That's just such a gorgeous instrument. And I have, uh, I have buyer's guilt about every, every new toy that I buy. I try to figure out some way to make it justifiable. You know, why did I, why did I want an octave mandolin? Well, you know, I drive up and down the road. All my life, I drive around with my knees and play a mandolin. That's one of the ways I write songs. An octave mandolin, you know, hit, hits my voice in a little bit different place. Uh, and for some reason or other, I'm a, I'm a baritone, but that, I, I sing Norwegian Wood a fourth above where John Lennon sang it. Uh, but it, it, it just became a different piece of music on that instrument. The instrument really inspired me and the Beatles have been inspiring me my whole life uh, which and, and since you mentioned Paul McCartney can I keep going for a second no, please do <laughs> well Jimmy and I occasionally will will book a, a an unannounced acoustic show just to sort of because Jimmy doesn't play guitar every day he's got he's got a company to run and boats to run and all that sort of stuff and so when he's been off the road a while we'll book us we'll book a little unannounced acoustic gig to warm up and we were, we were booked as an opening act in the Hamptons for a surf band. And, uh, and we were playing, it was uh, Stephen Talkhouse and Amagansett. And we're just booking around playing, playing for a hundred people. And Jimmy looks over at me halfway through the show and he says, you nervous? And I said, I don't know, a little bit. How come? He said, your hero's here. And I looked out and, and Paul McCartney and his wife were just sitting down and this club is so small, it was literally, you know, I could have, I could have hit them with a paper wad. Uh, and then I was like, yeah, I'm nervous now. I'm, <laughs> I am nervous now. And he, he knows I'm the, like, a, I'm a ridiculous Beatle fan. I, I don't want to get competitive at how, how much of one, but I'm a ridiculous Beatle fan. So to stand in front of uh, all the ways you dream about 
meeting Paul McCartney, none of them for me were me playing and him listening. I wanted to be in the audience, you know. But so Jimmy throws me this. He he, he says, I, I want to let my guy here. He's a he's a instrumentalist. I'm going to let him play play an instrumental. And I did my little version of Little Martha, and I couldn't even look. I was looking straight down at the stage. I couldn't look at the crowd at all. But I, I played Little Martha and I made it through it. And at the end, Jimmy's like, look up. And I look up and McCartney's jumping up and down with his hands in the air and whistling and clapping his hands. It just, you know, I get chill bumps talking about it now because I'm still basically seven years old uh, as it relates to the Beatles. And he asked to meet me and it came out there and I, I was gonna, I was going to sh shake his hand. I stuck my hand out and he just bear hugged me oh. like, like, like your favorite uncle would bear hug you. And, uh, and I, I didn't know what to say, but I felt like I should say something because I'm from Mississippi and I'm not particularly a huggy guy and we were still hugging. <laughs> and I said, well, I have to say, Paul, you're, I think you're the best that's ever been. And, and Paul said, uh, well, that's probably right, but you, my friend are amazing. And, and that's really all I need in the way of compliments. And an hour later, Jimmy and I are, are packed up carrying our guitars. We were carrying our own guitars out to, to the parking lot. And Paul was still standing outside talking to anybody that wanted to talk, saying hello to anybody that wanted to say hello. And Jimmy Buffett and I are lugging guitars to, to his little SUV. And he said, you know what? If Paul McCartney's gonna be a nice guy, we gotta be nice guys. <laughs> cause if anybody deserves to get to be a jerk, he, he deserves it cause he's been bothered for his whole life. And he was just as nice as he could be to every soul in that place. So that's an inspiration and a role model for, for me and anybody else that's wanting to do this job. Yeah, definitely. I mean, especially these times too. And, you know, I'm looking at the album and a lot of the songs in there give you hope. One of Good Guys Win, which was actually written in 2006. It's one of, a little bit older song, but I mean, it's so perfect for the time we're in right now. Well, I, I thank you for saying so. It was, we wrote it for that movie Hoot. Uh, uh, our, our, uh, Jimmy was involved in that film, played a small role in, in the film. And uh, and I always loved the song. And Bill Withers, who we just lost here lately, Bill Withers always said, man, you should record that song. You that's, I, He always loved that song. And that one and, uh, and, and Changing Channels, which I wrote with Jimmy, those two have been around a while, but uh, I've never, I've, I've never recorded my own version of them. And I kind of wanted to get that done. And I look forward because of this piece of time that we're in right now. I look forward to, to being able to sing something positive to folks and mean it, you know, because some it's, it's easy to get caught up in, in, in negative and just keep going, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I personally believe positive and negative are both sort of self-sustaining. So if I'm going to err on the side of something, I'd rather be a little extra positive. Well, I mean, the, the title time. track, I mean, just jumped out at me because it was once in a lifetime or each day is once is once in a lifetime. It's fantastic. It's not was upbeat, but that came about over breakfast, didn't it? Yes, it did. Uh, my buddy Drake White from uh, from Gadsden, Alabama, was we, we are frequent the same uh, same greasy spoon uh, breakfast spot over here in in my neighborhood in Nashville, and uh, and just ran into him, and we're just small talking, and he's like, "How's everything going, man?" I said, "Man, I, I love every day. Every day is once in a lifetime." And he said, "Oh." We should write that, and I would have just said it and gone home and and started thinking about something else. But but he pointed it out that there was something special about that, and uh, and we wrote it. and And I am really glad that he he hit pause for me and and, and we got in there and wrote that song because it it is special to me and it's something to you know to be reminded of that every day is an opportunity. Yeah, and I think it's it you know because we've had so many things hit at once this year and I think a lot of people you can tell it's almost like they're going through the five stages of grief so it's kind of good to, to get that little bit of a reminder yeah and, I, and I'm not a you know I, I'm not everything is perfect I'm just saying no matter no matter what your life is life is great no right. matter what it, it it's the best thing we got whatever our life is today is the best thing we have and it, it's sort of a I look at it as personally not just an opportunity, but as a responsibility to figure out some way to enjoy it and try to make things better. And I, and I look forward to waking up every day and taking another shot at it. Well, I mean, just on a personal story here, I was a high school janitor right after college, which my dad was super proud of that one. Yeah. Uh, but I discovered it's my job at that point. And that got me through that, kind of gave me a little bit of an attitude change. So I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, 
one of my favorite songs on the on the CD is is or the album. I guess technically it's albums now. It's an album for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like what do we call these things these days? Anyway, alive and in between, which I love the the story. It's you know if if you're a big fan of of Belmont stories, I guess it's kind of rooted in you growing up. But I loved yeah. how it came about, how this song came about. Well, uh, I, I was asked to write a song as a part, part of a, a, an art exhibit that, that took a piece of literary art and, and asked a, a music, musical artist to, to read that literary art and interpret it. And they took a visual artist and, and had them interpret it. And uh, there's a book by Harrison Scott Key called uh, The World's Largest Man. And I was really, it, it, he was writing about the same, really the same part of Mississippi that I grew up in. So I identified with it in a big way but it just sort of rekindled all of these little stories that my dad told and the, the guys that sat around our courthouse in Belmont and whittled and exaggerated basically for a living. Uh, Barney. Barney, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it sort of rewoke up all those folks in me and, and this song came about from that. And I'm, I'm really happy about that as well. And, and it's a little guitar lick I play when I change guitar strings for the last 30 years, I've been sort of playing that little main uh, the, the little main shuffle lick that's the that's the intro in that. So I don't know. It goes. It's. It's. It, I don't want to say it's. It, it's almost like it goes across more than one generation, even though I'm just me <laughs> the whole time. But 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 I, I. It's got something from me when I was ten and twelve years old, and I'm sixty two now. So the fact that it it comes across all of that and and it makes me think about all the time that's transpired since I hit the ground and and now. Uh, that, that song has an appeal to. Yeah, musically, I love it. Like you said, the guitar is in it's fantastic. But once again, your harmonica playing, you did a great job. <laughs> well, it's, uh, well, you know, Fingers was a real blues player. My harmonica playing is sort of more the old Bob Dylan suck and blow, you know, <laughs> just try not to pass out. But, uh, but, I, but I'm having a big time with it. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you, you definitely had fun. Um, that's why they call it falling. You know, you were talking about a little bit before how not everything is always shiny and happy, and but it is what it is, and that song kind of is a good reminder that you know what, yeah, you're gonna fall down, but yeah, well, and uh, once again, I, I was a I was a big fan of Roger Miller uh, as a songwriter. Yeah. He, he was a songwriter not like anybody else, and I think that song was probably a little bit of me trying to tiptoe into Roger's world a little bit. You know, I was try, I was I was trying to channel a little bit of Roger Miller writing that song and uh and it's it, it's big fun for that reason you know you, you and i were talking a little bit before we started recording about creativity and you've been writing since what about 14 15 about that yeah, yeah. and it's hard sometimes not to cover back over new ground but i mean i listen to a lot of these songs and yes i can tell it's mac and yes i can hear your wisdom and some of the quirkiness in the writing but it all still sounds very fresh how do you manage to do that how do you keep creative and, and keep that going without just constantly going back over what you've already done? Well, I've, I've, I've always had an inquisitive mind. You know, I'm always trying to learn things. I'm always trying to get better. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna get better. I'm just always trying. But, uh, but it, it, it's a little tricky. Probably all the stuff that, that wells up inside of the young teenager has, has worked its way out by the time you're 35 anyway. And, it's, and from that point forward, it becomes like the last couple of bites of crab meat. You've got to work. <laughs> you have to get down in there and poke at it a little bit to find anything good. It doesn't mean there's nothing there. And, uh, and it's rewarding in its own way. To, I, I have to reach further to find something new now, but, but I sure am glad that I have the opportunity to do it and, and, and that I occasionally get it. I occasionally get something that, that I don't want to say that I love, but that I can stand, <laughs> you know, which are, that's the other thing is you keep, keep working over the years, your standards sort of spiral. You A, don't want to repeat yourself, but you B, want to get better, you know, so. I would think it'd be a nightmare if some, you recorded something you didn't really like, but it became a huge hit and you had to sing it over and over and over for the rest of your life. That's like pushing the boulder up the hill. Yeah, the Sisyphus thing. And honestly, when the first record came out and, uh, and, you know, and I, and I pretty much made my first album on the dare. These guys were saying, we're going to make a record on you. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. Because I had no desire to be in the middle of a stage, no desire to be in a spotlight. I wanted to write songs. I wanted to make music. But I didn't have any desire to be well-known or any of that. 
and they put out it's a crazy world was the first song we put out and it went up in the charts and my buddies who were all album rock guys are like man what'd you let it get in the charts for how did you <laughs> i was like i didn't know they were going to put it in the charts you know i didn't do anything i just sang it but what i asked myself then and i still ask myself about every one of these songs on the new album is if you know if if it's a crazy world is a big hit and and 40 years from now, I'm in some Holiday Inn lounge singing, being Mr. It's a Crazy World. Am I going to be okay with that? Yeah. And I said, I was, you know, I was 19, but I said, yeah, I'm going to be okay with that. I like It's a Crazy World. I'll take that. And, uh, and that's still the, the, the test I put to these songs. I, if, I, if I'm not going to be comfortable, you know, playing, a, a, you know, the, whatever the worst gig you can have in the world is, 20 years from now being Mr. Is this song, then I don't want to put it on a record. Right. So, so the, the fact that, that there's 12 on this record that I can stand in my sixties, I'm, I'm pretty tickled about that. And I hope you guys can stand it too. I, I think so too. It's good. Of course, the album's coming out on July 31st. So we got a little bit of a wait, but the, yeah. the first, the first song is out. You can, you can download that from all the places where you get your music. That's so right. That's and it's Once wonderful. in a lifetime with, uh, with Drake White's, uh, jumping in and singing with me he's a phenomenal singer yeah i heard you sing i saw the video of you singing it solo having to do the do the beach boy part like you all said all the answer backgrounds yeah i'm i'm not really long-winded by nature and i've had a couple of heart attacks at this point so i don't know if i need to sing that song by myself a whole bunch of times but i did it once you did you you were a little bit flush and maybe a little Ooh. blue by the end of it but you pulled it off i had to walk it off yeah well, Mac, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I just appreciate you taking the time to, to visit with us. Um, the album's great. And of course, I just am a big fan and appreciate all you've done, not only for the music business, but for Mississippi too. Well, I, you know, I appreciate Mississippi and what it's done for me and what it does for me. It's, uh, it's still a big part of the way that I look at the world. And it's, and it's part of my favorite way that I look at the favorite things about the way I look at the world have a lot to do with Mississippi and you know some of the some of the worst of the problems that the rest of the world is going through right now Mississippi has kind of I don't want to say we fixed them but we've been dealing with them longer than a lot of folks that are right now and uh, and, and it's not as daunting I don't think to, to Mississippi folks who understand our community uh, and that that we all need one another you know you you can like somebody better than somebody else but we all we all need to get along we need we, we need one another to to get by and you know mississippi helps helps me remind myself and anybody that listens to me play and sing that and i'm grateful for that i do love your mom's quote here it's just uh, as part of it's a better part of living part of the lyrics on that but just um your mom told you at one point make something of yourself when you walked out the door <laughs> and i think i think you listened i really do i think it worked out okay well, I'm still trying. I'm still trying. <laughs> she's, I got a feeling she's, she's drawing a bead on me every morning. So I, 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 I want to do right by my mom. She was a sweetheart. Well, good. Mac, I just want to say thank you again and, and we'll sign out, but um, good luck on the new album and, and I'll post some stuff about it as time goes on because I want folks to hear it. I appreciate it, Marshall. Uh, I hope you never have to draw me again, but you did a really fine job that one time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, usually if I draw you, you've done something really bad. So, <laughs> Well, the folks at Belmont were really tickled. They, yeah, they were, I, I heard from all about every one of them. So it was pretty Yeah, there's, there's not that many of us. No, it wasn't a lot of messages, but they were happy. So that was good. <laughs> good job. Well, take care. Stay safe. Thanks.